All right. Well, I'd like to welcome our uh, next guest on Fireside Chats, uh, Dr. Drew Lorry. So Dr. Drew Lorry is the principal scientist of climate and environmental applications at NEWA, the uh, National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in uh, New Zealand. And Drew draws on his diverse scientific background, including geology and dendroclimatology, to improve our understandings of the global climate system. He's also a co-lead at the Southern Hemisphere Assessment of Paleo Environments uh, focus group uh, supported by the International Quaternary Union. And if you have ever wondered uh, who in the world figures out all this stuff about climate, you're at the right place. It's this guy. So uh, I'm glad to have you on for a fireside chat. Uh, Dr. Lori, uh, it's been a been a while coming, but we made it through the holidays, and uh, I'm glad we get to get to do this. Yeah, likewise, it's been a long time coming, um, especially for us down here. We, when we initially uh, tried to line this up, it was just before uh, a large scale national lockdown to try and really prevent the spread of the Delta variant, uh, which lasted for more than 100 days for us. Uh, so pretty extreme, but we're we're through the back end of that, and it's great to see you. Yeah, you too, you too. Um, so let's just start with who you are and what you do. Uh, you can share your story, uh, what you do, how you got there. You can start back as far as childhood, or you can zoom up to wherever is close to present as you like to start. Sure. Um, well, I, I grew up in the United States. I grew up in New Hampshire um, in a town that's very far from Boston. And so I'm, I'm born and bred New Englander. Um, I've always loved the outdoors um, and the forest in particular. And, um, and so, so look, I think jumping ahead to uh, undergraduate education, I, I did an undergrad in earth sciences at Boston University. And during that time for one of my senior uh, projects, um, I really fell in love with quaternary geology. And I was looking at varved lake sediments in New Hampshire. And I was really interested in, in sort of not only the, um, the history of the ice sheets that used to cover the state, but also the fact that you could match the patterns of lake layers, like a fingerprint in time, mm. and try to tell something about the history of, of that, that site. And there was, of course, a very famous um, uh, geologist called Ernest Antebs who put together a chronology, um, a VARV chronology for New England. It's recently been um, completed by Jack Ridge and colleagues at Tufts University. But that really had a, an impact on me. And um, quite, um, I guess, quite actually, Antebs also got um, a bit corrupted by Dendro and he went down, he went um, to Arizona, you know, um, you know back, back in the early 1900s. And um, so he ended up being a tree ringer. Um, wow. I, I thought, or barbs for my master's degree. Um, I, I went to University of Maine for that, and I got sidetracked into Antarctic research. But my love for um, for that high resolution uh, record never sort of um, went away. And uh, so when I was shopping around for a PhD project, um, at the time I was working in an ice core lab, and the guy who I was working for saw this advert for a project on cowrie tree rings in New Zealand, and I applied for it, and I got it, and. Uh, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> so here yeah. I am. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. So I didn't realize that. I, I just thought you were uh, native to uh, New Zealand, and that's just kind of what it was. So that's fascinating to me right off the get-go. So, all right. So there are so many different directions and, and things that I'd love to ask you, but uh, if it's all right with you, could we start with your work on the cowrie trees? Uh, maybe we could get into some of the, the glacier stuff I know that you've done. Um, I don't know if that's ongoing or not, but uh, yeah, if you, if you kind of just tell us what the cowrie trees are, their significance um, and what you do with them. Sure. So um, when I arrived in New Zealand, I didn't know what the hell a cowrie was. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd never done any dendro um, before. Mm. So wow. I surprised, imagine when I first went into a remnant, piece of forest with Cody and confronting one of these trees that was a meter and a half diameter, you know, <laughs> being from New England, <laughs> um, you know, it's not, not typical for what we would see in those parts, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I mean, amazing, um, 
amazing in that they're they're a relic of Gondwana. There are 19, spe 19 species in the Agathis genus that are spread across the Western Pacific. This is the southern most of those, um, those trees. Uh, it's restricted to the northern subtropical part of the North Island where, where I'm based. And previous work on it um, had, sh had shown that it had potential not only as a dendrochronology candidate, but also um, its longevity. Um, fantastic. I mean, quite common for trees, living trees to be 600 to a thousand years of age. Wow. And um, initial work on the dendro was done um, in the mid 1900s um, and then expanded on uh, in, in a large campaign that um, Val LaMarche and Peter Dun Dunwoody um, did in, in the 70s when they went everywhere, basically. Um, that was built on by a, an ecologist uh, based here, John Ogden, um, who was interested in, in um, processes of succession um, over long time periods, gap phase ecology. And so trying to understand the, um, the stand dynamics and um, the ecology dynamics of, of these protocarp broadleaf forests in New Zealand and in a situation where we've got really a, you know, less than 4% of the native um, remnant forest remaining because of course it was taken away by a number of progressive clearances yeah. first, by, first by Polynesians and and Maori and then Europeans um, really making a good go of it um, in the 1800s into the 1900s so Kauri getting back to it it's it's a protected species you cannot cut it down um, you know so it's been protected since 1976 I think and um, and Free ring work uh, was was not only interested in the aging of the of the trees, but also um, the dendroclimatology aspects were explored by um, two of my mentors, Anthony Fowler and Jonathan Palmer. And um, I studied under Anthony. I have a really good um, working relationship with Jonathan. We still both of us still work together. Um, all of us still work together. And um, I was taught dendrochronology here by Gretel Boswick who's um, based at Auckland University and she came out of Sheffield. So maybe my perspective of gender and cross-matching is, is maybe a European um, one. I'm really grateful for her, her continued um, guidance and mentorship in, in Dendro, it's been super helpful. Uh, they discovered a, a significant climatic signal in the cowrie that's a bit unusual in that you can try to correlate the ring with patterns to temperature rainfall, other local climate variables, but it locks on most strongly to the Southern Oscillation Index, which is the atmospheric measure of the El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomenon. So really interesting that we can sort of um, try to reconstruct an aspect of ENSO uh, using Cody tree rings. Put that together with the fact that we've got living trees that go back hundreds of years in some cases, And the subfossil material for the late Holocene, plus the subfossil material for the the late late LGM, um, you know, the late glacial period, um, right around the time of the Antarctic cold reversal and the Younger Dryas um, cron is wood that's preserved, um, and and MIS three, which is marine isotope stage three, about fifty nine thousand to twenty seven thousand years ago. So nowhere else in the world really are we aware of a resource that um, exists like yeah that uh, everything about that is fascinating <laughs> i mean that just as a, a dendrochronologist thinking about the living tree itself you know the ones still standing in the forest the four percent and you know in, in a way it's kind of analogous to uh what happened with the prairies and the you know great plains in the u.s i mean you know it used to be just this vast thing um and now it's just i mean a, a very tiny sliver of what what it used to be but uh the fact that the 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 living tree rings go back so far but then on top of that you've got this sub fossil wood you can you speak just a bit to i mean you mentioned you know going back like fifty nine thousand years uh i remember reading a paper um i don't know if it was on enso or or what it was but i i know like the maybe the um Oh gosh, what's it called? The magnetic field reversal around 42,000 yep. years ago or so. I mean, so can you kind of give us just a little bit of the scope of what uh, the cowrie, uh, you know, long age can can tell us? 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I think it'd be useful if I if I focus for a moment on the subfossil wood that's yeah. the marine resource. And one of the great um, applications of that wood resource to, um, is to do sequential radiocarbon dating down these very long sequences of rings that are in individual um, wood samples. A couple of them are behind me there. The one that is on the ground, that's the smaller of the two. That's a piece of wood that's actually in that science paper where it covers about 1500 years of time, um, about 40, 43 to 42,000 years ago, and it captures the onset of the Lachamps um, excursion. And so of course, um, when the geomagnetic field changes, um, you get a change in um, you know, protection of Earth to, um, to bombardment from, from solar radiation and, and cosmic rays. And, um, and the production of radiocarbon in the atmosphere um, changes. And therefore, that changes um, the, the signature of radiocarbon in the tree rings. So we can track that. It's, it's one of the only resources, a true atmospheric um, uh, resource for radiocarbon uh, change in variability through time. So that's important globally because um, if you look at the construction of the NCAL curve, largely speaking, um, the structure of it beyond um, 27,000 years ago is dominated by much lower resolution um, terrestrial archives that have complications from things like um, like dead carbon and um, and also not do not have the internally precise chronologies of our tree ring our replicated tree ring measurements so that that's why calorie is special it can give something to the rest of the quaternary community in terms of a, a much more well-defined um, atmospheric radiocarbon curve that can be used for calibrating uh, radiocarbon dates. Yes, God, that's incredible. Again, I, I, I mean, I could just gush over calorie trees. <laughs> They're just so amazing in the science that that can be done and the data they, you know, give us. But okay, so, so how in the world were these preserved? I mean, how, how do you have tens of thousands of re uh, years worth of rings uh, that weren't rotten and that, that don't contain that dead carbon? Yeah. So I mean, every one of those um, samples is a is a, a time capsule, and it encompasses maybe in some cases only a few hundred years of time, depending on how fast the tree was growing, hmm. or in some cases, it might it might have lived a long time and just been one of the lucky ones that was um, uh, long lived and also happened to be preserved um, in in bogs. Now, that's the that's the key thing is the preservation potential for kauri within its growth range was actually very good. Um, for most of the time through, through, through the pre-Holocene um, period, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but um, for instance, for, M, for marine isotope stage three, um, when these trees fall, I mean, obviously they got a lot of weight and they fall into, into bogs and this boggy material um, envelops that wood and it's anoxic. So it provides a very good um, environment for preservation. In fact, so much so that when we've been on sites with people who, who are excavating these trees, they, they get rolled over and they fell on top of a, a leaf mat or a series of cones that you can take and that the cones are green and you watch them oxidize right in your hands. Oh, they just, wow. So very, very good. I mean, we've got very good bark, bark edge preservation, other macrofossils, mm. trees that are well preserved. And um, and, and so Cody as well has, has got a lot of gum in it. Um, it's got a very, um, very dense um, wood structure for, for a soft, um, for a soft wood, for a conifer. Um, it has an equivalent density, I think an equivalent density of American walnut because okay. of the, of that, of that resin. And so that Cody gum that's inside of it, the resin that's inside of it, that also helps to, to preserve um, uh, those woody, woody tissues. Yeah, I've seen, um, I mean, they even have like sculptures of the gum from the trees. I've seen, you know, pretty amazing things, things, uh, you know, insects and things like that that are stuck in a kind of the Jurassic Park, you know, <laughs> idea, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that, that's one of the things that makes them remarkable. So, um, so the preservation potential when the tree is toppled initially is very good. The other thing is that for temperate mid-latitude regions, um, this is a region that was not glaciated. So you may have had a situation at times in the past periodically, but 
with with um, the Laurentide and, and Eurasian ice sheets, okay, coming from the north and you know expanding expanding down across the landscape for something that was previously forested, that preservation potential um, is going to be much lower in that sort of setting than say New Zealand, where we didn't have glaciers plowing across the landscape, so the peats were preserved. Okay, mm -hmm. the only time where they may have not been preserved or preservation potential might have been lower is times when uh, the climate was drier. So you might not have had, um, as the bogs might not have been as, as saturated or, or water laden or conducive for preserving a tree that fell down. And an example of that may be that um, may be evident from the fact that we have not located any wood of, of LGM age, last glacial maximum age. Um, we've got a gap in time. And it's known that cli our regional climate conditions were, were different in Northland during that period. Okay. Okay. So, you, so it puts kind of that upper limit on, on how far back you're going to find these, at least right now, that's what it seems. Yeah. At least in, in the landscape that we're able to access, you know, the other thing is that sea level was, you know, about 130 meters lower than, mm -hmm. um, than during that time that, that exposed shelf area may have also had held forest, a mosaic of this forest during mm -hmm. that time. Um, you have to also be reminded that, that the, the relative distribution started to break up during a much colder, um, a colder climate during the, the glacial maximum. But we can't access those environments. We don't know what their preservation may have been like because we, you know, we just can't get to them. They're underwater. Um, but with what we can get to, what we have got to now, um, there's a gap. And our, our leading explanations have to do with things like preservation potential uh, more than anything. The other aspect is that the environment's been modified. I mean, we're not in a perfect situation where, um, you know, it has been, you know, said before, um, prehistory was caught alive in New Zealand um, mm -hmm. because of the freak show of, of a lot of the, you know, the forest and, and the fauna. Um, but, you know, people made quick work of it. They took the choicest cuts and it's a butchered landscape, especially the forests and the native, you know, the native forests. Mm -hmm. And so by the time Europeans arrived, 50% lowland um, forests have been cleared by slash and burn um, techniques, Polynesians and, and Maori. And then after that, the Europeans came in with mechanization and, um, and did the rest. And so um, those environments that Swamp Cody were preserved in, in lowland areas, um, have been significantly modified. They also found a market for, Europeans found a market for the gum, um, so that the sap that comes out of the trees fell into bogs, congealed, and sits there like a nugget. And that material was, pr was processed and was highly valuable for shipbuilding and as a sealant. Oh, okay, okay. If there was enough today, if there was enough of it around today, it would still be mined. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So it, the exploitation of the Kauri trees is, I mean, it, it's limitless. It basically every aspect and uh, every landscape that it exists on, um, if it's dug up, it was, something was done to it. It was, if, if it was there to be taken, it was, and if it was there to be used, it was exploited. And and um, in some respects, fair enough, because that that is, you know, I can't blame anyone for doing that that's human nature yeah. they did realize very late in the piece almost too late um that hey this these trees are going to be gone if we don't protect them and that's why they were protected yeah yeah i mean that's the story of forest uh anywhere and everywhere that's 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 human nature for you <laughs> and it's a resource and and you don't understand you know that it's not a limitless one until you know hindsight kicks in right that's right and so um Fast forward after the gum digging industry sort of died, um, you had a conversion of a lot of um, lowland areas that would have held this kauri, um, swamp kauri in particular, to pasture. And mm. that draining, the peat compresses, the wood doesn't compress and it rises up and people want it out of their paddock so that they've got a nice place for their sheep and their cows um, to go or, or their tractor to go to, to plant um, uh, food crops. And so it, it was, it's taken out and, and, um, a, a small market, a niche market was found for it in, in the seventies and eighties. And, um, and then, uh, you know, it's been ticking over. And then in, in the two thousands, um, it, it exploded, you know, it really exploded where there's a certain mm. small from a certain small amount of, of practitioners that was mined and, and dimensionalized into tables and other crafts bowls 
um, and that was sold, but nearly an order and a half of magnitude increase in the external um, in, into the export market uh, for a three or four year period. And wow. it was highly is highly concerning to, to um, people who had been in the industry. It was highly concerning to people who have environmental concerns about where these trees wetlands, in some cases in wetlands, not all, um, that people are just going to go poke a 30 ton digger into a protected wetland just to get at this log. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then the other aspect was that, um, yeah, basically how much of it is left for science, you know, and, and we're obviously scrambling here. We, you know, it's a couple people on the ground scrambling to get this into an archive for posterity. Yeah. And so the government um, sort of put the clamps on things. Um, at that time, we, we did a, a bit of a write-up on the scientific values of it, talking about some of the, the aspects that I've looked at already with radiocarbon and climate reconstruction. And it's, it's slowed right back down. Um, but, you know, our, our goal really is if it comes on the ground, we'd like to know about it, we'd like to map it, and we'd like to get it into this archive so that we can study and that it carries on for posterity because we certainly know we, we don't have all the techniques now, but right. in 20 years, a bright young thing will come along and be able to <laughs> do something else wonderful with it. And so that's, that's part of the reason why we have this archive is that we have a stewardship um, opportunity here to present uh, a Taonga, which is a, a, a you know, a um, a sacred thing for New Zealand. Yeah, and that, that was something I was going to ask you too. The, the, what, can you speak a bit to the cultural significance of the tree to the Maoris and uh, other indigenous people? Only minimally, okay? Only minimally. Sure. So I won't wade in too deep because that's really their story to tell. But yeah. I'll relate what I've been told by, by Maori that we have worked with um, uh, Maori. So we have worked with... Um, with various iwi, which are the tribes um, in and around Northland and Auckland and the Waikato, uh, when, when we've done previous work. And um, they've worked alongside those forests. And um, the story that I that has stuck with me anyway, this is my version of it, um, is that the wairua, the spirit of Māori, has been held in Kauri. Um, mm. Kauri um, was holding it there, waiting for, for Māori to emerge. In, in Aotearoa, which is New Zealand. Yeah. And so if you think about that, then, then the metaphysical connection between um, the spirit and the, and the culture, um, and also, you know, whakapapa, which is your, you know, your lineage and your relationship to everything in the environment, um, you would have to imagine that that existed for, for all time. And therefore, you've got the living trees, but then you've got their, their, their ancestors, their parents, their grandparents in the bogs, you know, having passed on that, that wairua um, down through time. And so if you extend that all the way back for as long as we think Cody have been around, I mean, you're talking, you're talking in the, um, you know, pre-Cenozoic era, okay, wow. Mesozoic, Mesozoic era type longevity, okay, for that connection. And that's very powerful. I, I think it's a very powerful connection. And, um, and again, their story to tell, absolutely wonderful and, and a huge privilege to, to be a part of, I guess, that, that guardianship of, of part of this resource. No, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for sharing what you did. And uh, I, it would be amazing to get, you know, a, a longer, longer, you know, um, Maori perspective uh, at some point too. Uh, the Kauri trees are just so amazing. And uh, I mean, you know, there's so many things like I could ask you about like the calorie dieback. That's a big issue. Um, I know they're building uh, platforms on which to walk to prevent the spread of uh, is a certain fungus. Is that is that what the, the main threat is? Yeah. By top, there are attacks on agathis, so PTA, and it's a real problem and it's very sad. Um, I think a lot of research still needs to be um, devoted to that. I, I think that um, even going back in time to figure out um, exactly uh, was it endemic? What are we dealing with here mm. in terms of how long it's been around? Um, but, you know, confronting the problem immediately of the spread of it, um, that there's a big campaign around that. And obviously how people traipse around a forest, particularly the remnant forests that we have, um, is really important. And they've done things with walking tracks. They've tried to minimize the spread through um, uh, pest control. So, I mean, feral animals, particularly yeah. pigs, um, really, really bad news. So that's, that's been an element of trying to control that. And also, um, 
there's an interest in whether or not you can treat a tree that's infected already and make it better again. And there's certain parties that, that feel like that's a, a viable option as well. Yeah. But anyway, okay. in a forest, and we have had to work under, under constraints of PTA uh, mitigation. Um, you've got to have a plan about how you're going to mitigate the spread of, of cowardly dieback. And um, just to give an example, I actually haven't cored, I haven't cored living cowardly trees since 2010. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So really yep. locking it down. I mean, that's, that's good, you know, until you get a, a good understanding. Is this a, a root rod, a heart rod? What, what, what are the main issues? Um, it looks like, well, from my understanding, um, there's, there's a couple of different fungi that naturally occur mm. with, with, um, but this one in particular looks to me like it's quite severe in terms of like a, a collar rot, like bark rot. So basically it's attacking right under the bark. And I've seen trees that are, completely debarked around one hemisphere of the tree wow. and the tree they're resilient i mean they're really amazing to see i mean i've seen a two and a two meter wide cody that sequestered this and it's got this really really neat you know roll of bark that's come around just to try to isolate it and sap coming down you know gum yeah. coming out of the trying to isolate um you know isolate itself from that so it, they're they're trying to defend themselves but they really i think can't do it without our help if if we are the ones who've modified the environment and allowed these um these vectors into the environment, we should do something about it. Yeah, for sure. Oh man, there's a lot going on with Calgary, and uh, I I don't want to uh, spend. I, you know, we don't, we only have so much time left. Um, if, if there's anything else you want to say, you know, this is your your story. But uh, um, I'd also like to see if if you don't mind talking about. Um, I saw on YouTube, and I can link this too <laughs> on a video of you. And uh, I don't remember the the gentleman's name, but uh, the, on the your glacial research, um, you're taking photos from planes. I don't know if you do a lot of satellite things now, um, but can you speak a bit to the glacial um, aspect of your climate research? Sure, sure. So I, I wear my hats here in New Zealand. Um, I, this this is one part of my paleo climate um, research hat, but the climate. Um, research that I do, a lot of it now focuses around observations. And one of the observations that we make here is of a series of glaciers across the Southern Alps. There's about 50 of them that have been monitored since 1977, almost every year um, with oblique photographs. And uh, that is tracking not only the glacier change, um, the sort of plan form change of, of, our, of our snow and ice, but also the way that where the snow line altitude is um, at the end of every summer, which is a proxy for the equilibrium line altitude and can be used as a proxy for mass balance. And um, look, I'm not going to um, sugarcoat it. Uh, our pattern here in New Zealand is not different from anywhere else in the world in terms of the overall ice loss that we've seen over the last four decades. Um, and certainly concerning is that in recent years, um, I think that we've seen an acceleration of the snow line altitude up the side of the mountain. Um, we've got um, a situation where we've got warming temperatures repeated um, experiences of marine heat waves that get evacted onshore onto the Southern Alps and the glaciers feel that heat in the mountains and, and you get more melt and um, it drives the snow line higher. And the, the concern is that um, you have to have the, the snow line below the mountaintop in order to have a glacier, right? And so if it's going repeatedly off the top, that whole glacial mass is melting and um, you're damaging it and it's not being replenished by subsequent seasonal snowfalls. And, and uh an accumulation of ice eventually and so that's that's very bad for the long-term health of our glaciers and we're expecting to lose quite a lot of the glacierized landscape in the future as that trend carries on so the baton was handed to me um i know that i'm gonna be um you know watching a, a pretty hardcore um sequence of destruction over the next couple of decades i'm, I'm hopeful it'll last that long in this, in this industry who knows but um I'll be there, you know, watching it and documenting it. And I'm hopeful that by documenting it and by getting it out there, we can change people's perceptions about the urgency of this issue that we have to deal with. Um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the right guy to give this message. A lot of people give these climate messages across the world, um, but we've got to keep trying and we've got to try to get the messages out in different ways um, so that change can happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, 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 yeah. I mean, who knows if we're ever the right person, but we are the people, right? You are the person doing it. And that's, what's important. Uh, and I mean, speaking to, 
it's one thing if you get into the climate science, if you understand the numbers, you understand where they come from. But uh, I don't know how much is more compelling than seeing, you know, photos over long time periods and seeing the, the year by year and decadal erosion uh, or melt of the glaciers and the fact that they don't come back. Uh, it's such a compelling story and photo. And so I'm definitely glad you're doing that work for sure. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, we we came up with a bit of a catchphrase here, glaciers don't lie. Yeah, 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 that's right. Been through the ringer with denialists saying that, you know, climate um, observations have been manipulated, mm -hmm. um, being trashed about that. And, um, you know, um, the, the climate scientist, a climate scientist based in Switzerland, Heinz Wanner, um, said, let me talk to you about climate change in front of a melting glacier. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me uh, when he said that and uh, we did a we did our first um, video on the snow line uh, survey called glaciers don't lie you can find that online and um, it shows it shows the long-term um, effects of, of the warming on our glaciers in New Zealand quite clearly and um, it's undeniable what that um, what that source of warming is now yeah no that's that's powerful stuff uh, yeah if you don't mind like uh, when we're done well not right when we're done but at some point shoot me the a link or anything that you've got and I'll, I'll kind of you know link to that in the description that way people can have those other resources uh i definitely like that tagline i remember it from from the the youtube video that i watched of you too so uh good stuff sad stuff but it's so powerful so important to tell that story it um, is yeah go ahead go ahead even more important to tell it because we're in control of the script yeah yeah and so we can write, we can write a different ending. It may not be for ourselves within our lifetimes, but we're writing that ending for the generations ahead of us. And for those of us who work in places like forests and the beautiful places of the world, we want it to be around and as pristine as we've seen it in our lifetimes. And uh, I think that it's important to, to, you know, promote that intergenerational preservation conservation story um it can be applicable to glaciers as much as um as much as the the forest that um you and i work in yeah for sure i was gonna you know one of my questions that i like i always like to ask is why do you do what you do and and is there anything you'd like to say you know speaking to you know the the importance of what you do uh i'm i'm assuming that that was a that was a really good chunk uh, of it is there anything else you'd like to add on on why you do what you do Look, I really love it. And um, one aspect that we didn't talk about environmental and climatic research is that the applied side of things that we can get into here at NIWA, which I often um, have one finger in or, or an arm in, um, <laughs> we see how it can be applied to help people make decisions and to improve their lives. And in particular in the Pacific Islands um, and, and for Maori here, it can make a really big difference for how, how decision-making proceeds. So. Um, I know it's it's a frustrating field to work in sometimes, but the rewards when you see how that knowledge benefits people when it's applied properly um, are huge. So I think that um, carry on. We carry on with that because of that reason, amongst all the other ones, and that we we just we love what we do and we love getting out there and seeing all these beautiful things and and the curiosity factor of digging into um, a forty two hundred year old piece of wood there and a forty two thousand year old <laughs> piece of wood. And, and saying, okay, well, how has the climate really changed through time and having that evidence base for, um, for what, we, what we think occurred in the past. And, and that's, that sets us up for where we're going in the future, I think. Oh, right on. Good stuff. Thanks for that, Drew. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you're ready, let's, let's get into some uh, the, the fun questions here. Yeah, go for it. I mean, that was fun to me, but I, I like, you know, these are also fun. Okay, so let's start off with uh, the first two questions. Always ask, always ask, are uh, what is uh, your favorite tree? Oh well, it's it's Cody. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I could have guessed that, I guess, but uh, you know, just just to be safe. Sure. Okay, uh, favorite fireside food and beverage. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I've I've got a lot of trees being in northern New Hampshire at camp. Um, uh, you know, probably drinking a set of mixed beverages from my cousin serving them up to me. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would say on the side that I really enjoy New Zealand wine. I've, I'm quite parochial about my wine and, okay. and love it. I love New Zealand. Um, 
and uh, I think fireside um, fireside food, like definitely love like a a good sausage. Um, oh yeah. Done on, done on, maybe even a bit of a roast on the fire. Yeah. Okay, so something hearty. You're not you're not going for the the junky snack stuff. You're going for something nice and nice and warming. Yeah, I mean, I'll have a I'll have a s'mores, you know what I mean, or a marshmallow or whatever. If it's <laughs> up, I love I love meat meat on the open fire. That's um or, mm. or you know aired well. It's it's lovely. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm with you on that. So, if you could go back in time to young uh, Drew Laurie. Uh, what would you like to say to maybe your younger self, teenage self, or any any point in time, or would you like to jump in and interject? Look, I think I, as as I've gone on, um, the importance of of the time that you spent with your family and having those friendships through life are, are really um, the things that sustain you as you go on and and the trials and tribulations pop up. Um, and so I was, I think I'm lucky in that I availed. My- of a lot of those opportunities um but i think that there was you know this other stuff that you focus on as a kid where it's just sort of like it's irrelevant <laughs> but it make, makes you who you are so i think that it's hard to, to say if you hit the rewind button what would you change because you wouldn't be where you are now if you if you had um, done things differently but um i think that having patience um and being also mindful of what you say because words, words can stick with people for a long time. Um, just, just think a little bit more before you say. <laughs> yeah, no, sage advice, uh, advice we should all take. Uh, so if you could go to, um, no, hang on, I'm going to get this wrong. If your older self could come back to where you are today, what, what do you hope that they would be able to tell you? Um. Maybe some of the same things that I just iterated there, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. In the middle ages here of, of our lives, which I hope I'm in, um, the there's a focus on um, the mundane things in life, like our um, all the chores that we have to do, and and the running around and the rat race, and mm-hmm. and even to some employment, and not letting those those years um, that you have, for instance, with young children, slip away. Okay, I've got I've got two little girls. And they're lovely, and I love them to bits. They are just mm-hmm. there, and um, just keeping in mind that yeah, I, I'm passionate about my life and passionate about like academic career and that so, that sort of stuff, science. But um, really, like those windows of opportunity to engage with them on a daily basis. Like the days are so long, but the years are very short, and um, you've got to be careful that that doesn't go by too quickly because they're not kids like that forever. So I think my older self would probably say, slow it down, mm. you know, slow it and just, cut it, you know, cut it out, block it out, block the time out for it and spend as much as you can with these, these gorgeous uh, human beings. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, you, you think uh, something I kind of came to once I started studying trees and, and you know, longer lived life forms, you know, it, it changed my perspective on what, you know, how short time is for a human. And, you know, just the way you go about life, it, you've got, you've got to quit the rush. Um, you know, especially when you see some of these, you know, I've, I've got, well, they're all on the side of the building or of the room, but, you know, like you've got in the background there, you know, you've got these long, you know, dated cross sections that ex- extend, you know, thousands of years or a few hundred years. And you just realize, man, that tree stood the test of time, but, but, you know, we're, we're just, we're gone, you know? And, uh, yeah, so it definitely changes your perspective, and and you definitely touched on that. Yeah, it absolutely does change your perspective. Um, in terms of they have longevity, mm. um, we have great transformational ability, not only as geomorphic agents, but you know agents of change in general in the late in the landscape. So our agency, and what we choose to do with that agency, um, and how it's connected across the planet is is really ridiculous in terms of um, how. Sc- Good to stay a tree that's rooted in a forest for a while that's going to mm. sort of be a sentinel to the, this change if it, if it lasts so it does put your your perspective uh together on on time and agency i think looking at a county yeah man that's good stuff <laughs> okay so 
if you weren't be busy being a principal scientist, uh, what do you think Drew Laurie would be doing? Oh, I'd be making wine. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's what I'd love to do. Um, you know, my lockdown project in my backyard, I put in a micro venue. Um, so this is, a, this is now an ongoing uh, project for me. Um, it's something I think is going to ground me quite nicely. Uh, I think it's amazing what winemakers are able to do every year here, uh, given the variety of uh, climate and weather conditions that they have to confront. And somehow a miracle happens and they get a viable product at the end of the season. And um, so I'm pa quite passionate about if I wanted to experience it. And I've done many harvests and I've helped with winemaking before. And I, I always wanted to do something from start to finish. And yeah. so, um, so I've, I've put in um, six short rows in the backyard and I'm um, tending to those. And I'm hopeful to someday make a, make a wine that is an expression of that time and place and, and, and us really living on that property. Yeah, very nice. How, how long to maturity do you expect? I think that we'll, we might get grapes, you know, in, in three to four years time. Okay. Um, whether he's needed to make we want out of that scene. I mean, I'm nothing huge here. It's only a couple of couple of cases of boutique boutique stuff. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, looking. I think looking at a different career. Um, I do very much like um, if it was completely outside of science, um, it would probably be like I, I've fallen in love with viticulture. I'd say I really, really do yeah. love it. I like it. And at the end of the day, like you can evaluate that product as being it's good or it's not. <laughs> it's kind of like um, vegetables and, and like, look, I've got a friend who came through the, the lab with me. Um, she did some dendro and now she's an organic farmer. Wow. And it's amazing to see like the produce that she's produced, she's feeding people, which is um, yeah. a worthy thing um, to, to do. So I think that I would, I would like to probably be involved more closely with primary production if I was a, um, if I was in a different career. Yeah, I love it. I love how you say, uh, if, if I was in something completely different than science, then you say viticulture. And I just think, I don't think you'd be that far out of science. Yeah, no. <laughs> science unto itself. I mean, I'm out there yeah. and, and everybody you know, laughs at me for measuring the plants every day. And, <laughs> you know, I'm quite, I'm, yeah, quite somebody that, oh, you're very meticulous about it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, like, how, how do you, how else do you know how, how you're doing if you so, um, and there are a lot of people I've met in the viticulture industry, not scientifically trained. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they, okay. And, and even down to things like evaluating weather forecasts, they do, they do like ensemble weather forecasting in their heads, like looking at different models and saying, I trust this. I don't trust that. This is what it's going to be. And then they make a choice. Yeah. So, yeah, I think science is many different things to many people. It, it, it infects or permeates all the rest of, uh, you know, the world in many ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, winemaking, sure, yeah, it's scientific, but um, it's certainly not the science that I'm doing now. Yeah, you know, on, on that note, uh, I've always said, and uh, I think my wife both like, you know, thinks this is amusing, but also fears that it would come true. Uh, a long time dream of mine is to, to be a just just own a sheep farm, you know, and uh, so <laughs> maybe one day, you know, you can have your uh, wine production and I'll be uh, uh, in the pasture, you know, next to you, give you a shout. <laughs> great, great products. Um, I think a younger, slightly younger version of myself, why I came here, um, really passionate about fly fishing. Mm. And so fly fishing guide would be, um, plan, plan, um, a one, I guess, or something a one, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. And if I can afford to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, all those things sound great to me. Yeah. So, uh, let's see if you, um, do you have a favorite book or one that you're reading now or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Look with, um, with little ones, um, recently, <laughs> recently like, book reading time has gone, you know, down significantly. And I read so much from my job mm -hmm. during the often just, you know, put it down to be honest. But, um, I got a really nice book that um, last year that I'm just starting to pick up now. Um, it's called um, The World Before Us. Um, it's by Tom Hyam, who is a radiocarbon guru, and it's mm -hmm. about the dead ovens. Um, so really talking about that wonderful story about the genetic um, uh, links between, you know, between anatomically modern humans and what came before us, really. And um, I'm really excited to start reading that book. I just picked it up yesterday for the first time. Um, after having received it so there we go hey that's great that's great well I hope you uh, get to enjoy the book and 
you know, maybe, maybe read some pages between your, uh, you know, white papers you got to read and all that. Um, do you have a, well, do you have a favorite scientist or this can kind of blend into who's been most influential both, both personally, professionally and et cetera? Um, I think from the start, my dad, um, he's not a scientist, you know, he's a lay person. Um, mm -hmm. but his, his, what for me training, uh, I guess, if you will, doing, doing stuff in the outdoors and, uh, describing the power of observations and being, you know, being mindful and watchful and observing things, observing changes, not only to be a successful, say, hunter or fisherman, um, but also, you know, woodsmen are just generally watching the environment around you, self-awareness, um, situational awareness. Um, so my parents, I give full credit to them. Um, in terms of the teachers, um, yeah, I mean, really inspiring teachers in undergraduate and graduate school all the way through. Um, one of them, uh, Dee Caldwell at Boston University, he's um, long since left us, but he was a generalist. He, he, and um, that sort of steered me down the road of, of generalism in earth science, where you've got to have some specific skill sets, but learning about lots of different aspects of the earth system um, are important. And I, I just, um, I've benefited greatly from that wide perspective of, of being in geology and, and environmental science, but drifting to the left hand edge in climate and meteorology as well. Um, it's a really good mix for me. Um, and of course, um, you know, my mentors in, in uh, glacial research, George Denton at University of Maine, very, um, very formative to, um, I guess, to, to learn how to view the world and, and articulate um, very good questions um, and not looking at science through a keyhole and trying to see, um, trying to see the broader, broader perspective, but also making sure that you get the details right. And I, have, I had two very, very detail-oriented people with Anthony Fowler and Gretel Boswick here my dendro, dendro training and climatology training. Um, and I couldn't have asked for better people and better human beings to, um, to be with down here. So th those individuals from my academic training have been um, excellent. And also, again, the family support to start that off and to encourage, uh, encourage learning. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, if uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. And uh, if people want to um, reach out to you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that or follow your progress on your work or, or whatever? Sure. I mean, I, they're happy, they can email me if they'd like. Um, I, I'm on Twitter, as, as you are. So mm -hmm. connect me with whoever on there. Um, so I'm, and I'm happy to, to field questions. We do this um, all the time for the, not only the general public, but it would just be great to, if any other scientists, any other dendros, are out there and you know they want to have a chat um yeah i'd, I'd love that it'd be great yeah that, that'd be fantastic that, that's something you know like a long-term goal of mine is uh to have more of a hub for the dendro community and the the paleo community at large as well um i think that'd be a great resource and uh yeah maybe do some live streaming or something like that where we can kind of have some some discussion um and not be so sequestered i think that would be really great yeah yeah, likewise, I agree. Go for it. We can we can pack in behind you, support it. <laughs> Good. I'll need the support if I do go for it. I've got too many things, as you know, uh, as you do as well. But uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually, hopefully. Um, yeah, this has been awesome. I feel like I just like uh, we scratched the surface uh, of, of what it is to be Drew Laurie and to know Drew Laurie. But uh, I, I'm glad we got to do that. And uh, I look forward to it again. And uh, maybe, maybe we can send me a send me a shout and let me know some projects you're working on we can plan for another chat at some point i'm very very happy to do that joe and thanks very much for all that you do for coordinating these um perspectives and, and also um i do want to say like your advocacy um you know for people's mental health as well that's super important in this world i think it's important to be able to talk to people and uh try to steer people into positive space so keep up the good work and we really appreciate it Man, I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me uh, to, to have that gratitude. So I will. I'll keep doing it. I do it for myself and uh, do it for all the, the little Joes out there and, and uh, everywhere in between because we all need it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Take Drew. Time. Well, uh, it's been great. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Okay. Take it easy and um, all the best. You too.
Cheers. Bye. Bye.